Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Dr. Melanie Metzger, the chair of the Department of Interpretation, and we'd like to welcome you to the fifth lecture here for our 2013-2014 colloquium series. We'd like to welcome those who are here on campus as well as those who are joining us via live stream. The reason why we offer these lecture series throughout the year is to show and promote the research that's happening within the field from the students as well as uh, educating those who are working within the field about this new research endeavor. So with that, we'd like to welcome students who are here visiting from Lansing Community College, as well as welcome Oliva Moores, who's here from Belgium. We'd also like to thank uh, those who supported the lecture series, the ITRC, the Interpretation Translation and Research Center, as well as the Gallaudet University Regional Educational Interpreting Center, the G-U-R-E-I-C. And we'd like to give a special thanks to Bev Beverly Hollera, and I'd like to invite her to come up to say a few words. Hello, I'm Beverly Hollera from uh, JURIC, and we are a member of a national uh, consortium of interpreter education centers. And our goal is to try to uh, encourage and enhance more interpreters to become involved, not only in the field, but also those who are already in the field to enhance their interpreting skills. And we have multiple projects that we are working on uh, through time, typically they're involved in research and one of the research topics that we're very focused on these days is video relay interpreting services and so today we're very excited to have you all here listening to some of this new research that is very exciting and very new and welcome to all of you and thank you for coming today And there will be two future events that we'd like to let you know about. April 15th will be the next uh, colloquium presentation by Dr. Christopher Stone, who's a faculty member within our department. He will be giving a presentation about cognition and L2 uh, British Sign Language acquisition. And the respondent for that lecture will be Dr. Patrick Boudreau. And hopefully everyone who's here would be able to join us either here on campus or from a distance. And then at the end of March, twi the 28th through the 30th is when we'll have our international symposium here at Gallaudet. It'll be the first international symposium with the Interpretation and Translation and Research Center hosting that event. We'll be having various presenters coming from around the world to give a presentation. And it will be happening here at Gallaudet, and so hopefully people will be able to join for that. If you're not able to be here on campus, that will also be available via live stream. And we're encouraging uh, an international presence for the symposium. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Brenda Nicodemus, who's been working hard to make this happen and to be available for all of you here. So thank you for that. For today's lecture, we have two students who are within the PhD program here at Gallaudet. First, Erica Alley, standing over here, as well as Annie Marks. And the two of them have been doing research related to video relay service interpreting. And they'll be presenting for about 40 minutes, and then from there, a faculty member, Dr. Valerie Dively, will be coming up to respond to what's been said. And then at that time, we will open it up for questions from our audience. Just to share a little bit about our two presenters today, 
Erica Ali is currently in the process of finishing her PhD. She's in the dissertation phase of her uh, education. She's working on publishing her dissertation. She's also looking at trilingual interpreting and video remote interpreting. Annie Marks is also a PhD student. She's in study she's studying uh, interpreting research and pedagogy and looking at video interpreting research due to her own experience in working in the industry and her passion for technology interpreting and how it all works together. So this is a perfect research project for her and I'm looking forward to seeing her talk more about her research and with that I'd like to turn it over to Erica and Annie. First we want to thank everyone for being here today. I know that there are some people who are joining us via live stream. Thank you for being here and for those who are here in our presence, thank you for taking time to to be here despite the weather that we experienced over the last couple of days. It's a pleasure to have you all here. So in talking about video relay services, or VRS, we're thrilled to have you all here today because I'm sure that many of you have already been working in the VRS field. And for those of you who have yet to work in the VRS field, I'm sure that you will at some point in time in your future. So it's great to be able to learn a little bit more about what's happening with VRS. And we've seen a tremendous boom over the past several years of different centers being located throughout the United States. We have it here in the United States, but there are also other countries that offer VRS services. So France, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, those are just a couple of countries that are also offering VRS services. For our presentation today, we're here to talk more about VRS studies that have happened here in the United States. And unfortunately, we didn't focus on what's happening internationally. Um, the interviews that I had done uh, were participants who are here working in the United States, and Annie also did her research interviewing people who were here in the U.S. So we can only talk about what's been happening here in America, and that's the reason why we're focusing on VRS services here in the U.S. Let's just take a moment for the stage director. So every day um, across the country and across the world, really, uh, deaf people make calls. They make calls to family members, uh, colleagues, sometimes to call pizza, to make doctor's appointments, and they use video relay services in order to do that. And in our studies, we'll show some of what's happening with the actual interpreting process in VRS in America. The Federal Communications Commission set up rules related to VRS services and what interpreters are supposed to abide by. And the VRS corporate providers are also establishing rules that interpreters must follow. Just to give you an example, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, has three different mandates or rules um, that I'd like to just use as an example. And there are several other rules that are listed as well. But in terms of VRS, it says that it must be provided 24-7. VRS interpreters are not allowed to disconnect the call or must connect all calls and are not allowed to deny anyone d from making a call. And you're also not allowed to take notes about a particular call or to record it at any time. So those are just some of the mandates from the FCC. So obviously you can't save information from what work you're doing. It cannot be recorded, which means that typically with research, you're often doing interviews with um, the interpreters after they've done their work within the VRS Center. And Dr. Jeremy Brunson has done work in this area. He interviewed several people as well as uh, 
accounted for his own personal experience in working in the VRS setting. Uh, Katie Bauer also did research, and uh, she had done research via a survey, and that was looking more specifically at interpreter burnout. And then another example of research that has been done was Dr. David Quintil Pozos, and he's been working with his team looking at doing mock calls through the video relay service. And from there, the mock uh, calls were analyzed. Unfortunately, you cannot go into a VRS center and record actual data. And so that's part of the limitations to our studies. Um, from my own particular research, I did it via interviews with different participants. And Annie Marks did it related to footing shift. So we're doing uh, interpreting research work from two different perspectives on VRS. So today I'll be talking about professional autonomy with VRS. Professional autonomy basically m means the decisions that we're making when we're doing our work. So in a VRS call, we are making decisions about what it is that we want to do and how to make it effective. And I'll be talking more about that throughout this presentation. I started this research in 2010, but in 2007, I started working in a VRS center for the first time, and I was very excited and very eager to start working there. I felt like it was an empowering experience. It empowered deaf people to be able to make their own calls. It was amazing to me to see this type of technology. And as I had been trained on the different rules that I needed to abide by, I realized that some of them weren't effective. And so what I ended up doing during a call was different than what they told me I was supposed to be doing. And I thought that I was the only one experiencing this, and then I realized that others also were experiencing this frustration. And that was the reason why I decided to do a research project and started with my qualifying study research and looking at VRS looking at VRS providers' rules versus the FCC's rules and what interpreters are supposed to abide by. And oftentimes the VRS providers would tell the interpreters that these were the rules that were established and regulated by the FCC. And there were often rules that were established by the FCC that um, the FCC felt that they only were responsible for the communication portion and not necessarily about the work environment or the time amount for breaks that interpreters should allow should be allowed during the, uh, the assignment. And so oftentimes interpreters didn't even know where to go in order to get information and how to make a change. And that was the reason why I decided to engage in my own research project related to VRS for my PhD. So for my pilot study, I interviewed four individuals. One was a call center manager. One was a VIMS, or a, the vid a video interpreter members section of RID, a VIMS representative here in America. And also one interpreter who had worked for three different providers. And I felt like that was also important to, to gain some insight about whether or not you know, a person working in four different providers had different information to share. And then the fourth person or participant was a VRS researcher. So in doing this pilot study, the interview uh, took place with each of these individuals. And during the interview, I had talked to them about a particular rule within the VRS center established by the FCC. That at any point in time that you have engaged in a call, you must wait 10 minutes before you can transfer the call to someone else. Um, and then I asked them where this rule came from and if they knew where it was from. And I talked to them about various rules that were established for what interpreters needed to abide by within the call center. And when I asked them where they thought this rule came from, these were the responses that I got. So the interpreters had no idea who was regulating this decision. The VIMS uh, representative 
didn't know where this rule was from. The call center manager didn't know where this was from. And there was one quote that I took from one of these participants that I'd like to share with you. It's on the next slide. So even though the interpreters know that these rules are not effective, that they don't always work or aren't necessarily appropriate, sometimes interpreters would deviate from what it is that was expected from them. And that was the reason why I wanted to do my, my research study here. If the interpreters didn't know where these rules were coming from, would they actually follow the rules that were set in place? And that's what I wanted to look at. So every day, interpreters are making decisions, and oftentimes during our work, we're making decisions about what to do. And with that, we obviously have choices that we could follow the rules that have been set in place, or we could do something different. And I wanted to know when the interpreters were deciding to follow the rules versus not follow the rules. And I wanted to know if they were not following the rules, why they made that decision, and when they made that decision. And that was my interest in doing my research study for my PhD. In terms of my methodology, decided to use grounded theory. And grounded theory uh, is that I thought that I was going to be doing um, interviews with 30 participants. And with grounded theory, you can have more or less than the number that you set out to interview. Ground and with grounded theory, it basically means that if you're doing interviews and you realize that people are all saying the same thing, that at that point in time, you will stop conducting research and interviews. Um, and, and that's referred to as saturation when no further information is found by continuing to do the interviews. So, so far I've interviewed seven individuals. I've transcribed and analyzed four. And so today my presentation is based on the four that I've done my analysis on. And I'm, I'm expecting that there will be at least another 20 that I'll be doing here in the future. So it was a guided discussion. Um, I, I would ask them a question, and oftentimes they had assumed that there was a right or wrong answer from how they were supposed to respond. And I didn't want any question that I asked to influence the way that they decided to answer. So with that, I opened, uh, I opened with like a general question, and basically I started the inter interview by saying, okay, so recently with your work in VRS, can you tell me what your recent experience was from your last shift or I would say you know can you tell me basically what your shift looks like on any given day when you work in VRS and then from there a discussion occurred and if something came up that I wanted to engage more in a discussion about I would ask additional questions um, so they were video recorded throughout this process and then that interview was transcribed and analyzed and for each part of the interview after the video was recorded transcribed and analyzed I did the constant comparative analysis from additional data that I received so if the fourth person had said something during the interview I looked back to see if it had been said in recent or previous interviews with other participants and that was due to using the constant comparative analysis within my research. Interpreters often decide to make decisions based on what they feel would be successful for the interpretation. And when I ask them why they did a certain thing, or made a certain decision, they said it was because it made the interpretation successful. And this was applied in several different ways. The example of the phone tree or the automated phone system, you know, press one if you want to talk to so-and-so or press three for this, that, and the other. Using a phone system is part of mainstream culture. People who can hear and they typically would call in to any given service or organization 
you have to navigate your way through the automated phone system or the phone tree. And that's typically something that deaf uh, callers have yet to be uh, exposed to. And so f for that reason, they don't necessarily know that they have to press zero to talk to a live person. And oftentimes, as interpreters, we will ask for clarification if needed, even though this is not something that we're allowed to do. Uh, but this is something that we have to do in order to make the call successful. And asking for changes to the lighting so that you can see a person on the other side of the, the screen, or asking them to close the blinds behind them, or to change the directionality of their camera, are things that we often ask to do in order to make the interpretation successful. But it's not necessarily something that we are allowed to do. This is just one example of what one participant had stated, that they were in the midst of a call and the phone tree came up. And with the automated phone system, it says that you have to wait a particular period of time, and it says 15 seconds before a person will connect. And usually when a person answers the phone, hearing people often don't have any tolerance for silence, and they'll immediately hang up if there's no response on the other line. So in this situation, the deaf person said that they were going to be heading into another room and coming back, that they were away from the screen. And when the hearing person came on the phone, the interpreter responded by saying that the person was in the other room and that they would be back in a few seconds. And that was cultural mediation that occurred, even though it wasn't the deaf person who was saying that to the person on the other line. During another interview, the participant brought this up several different times that uh, when the deaf caller is mean, they typically will change how they respond to that call. And just to give you an example, if a deaf person fingerspells too quickly that the interpreter missed what it was that they said, or they weren't exactly sure what the deaf caller was trying to say, they often were met with the response that this is a lousy interpreter, you're lousy. And in that situation, the interpreter said that they would gloss the interpretation, which means that if the interpreter had asked to clarify a certain word or a specific word, and the deaf caller got angry or upset, the interpreter would then decide to gloss the entire interpretation without asking for clarification and just speaking the, the, the signs that were being used as opposed to making it a interpretation into English. And that was one of the ways that they decided to deal with an angry caller. And that was their response from one particular participant. Another way to deal with this issue is to transfer the call. But if you remember back to the 10 minute rule that the FCC had made that rule that said that the 10 minute rule is in place because they don't want deaf people to have to wait. Especially in a line of, of calls that are within the queue. And so that's the reason why they want them to have a timely response in a timely call. Um, but one person said that if the person was abusive or angry, they would transfer the call. And there, were, and there was one response that was stated that they would report the caller if they felt that they were being abused by a deaf person calling in. This participant said that there are people who are considered rule followers and then other people who don't necessarily abide by the, the rules. And this person said, I don't care what the rules say. This does not allow somebody to, to be angry or rude to me. And for that reason, I would transfer them despite the rule that's in place. But there are other people who will deal with an angry caller uh, because of the fact that that's the rule that's, that's in place. They may not even transfer them at any point in time, and they feel like this is a part of their job and that they will go ahead and interpret the call. So there are some people who are out there that feel that they have to take each call and to persevere through each call despite what it is that they're experiencing from one of the callers.
And at the same time, interpreters often feel that they are allies and advocates for the deaf community. So if there's an emotional call that happens, if there's a death in the family, or if there's somebody who's ill, um, a parent, for example, and they're telling their child this, the interpreter will often change how they respond to that caller to provide support and to empathize with them. And again, using the example of the phone tree, it seemed that that came up several times throughout the different interviews, that if a person were to make a call and they were given choices about which number they could press, some interpreters would educate the deaf community and say, well, if you just press zero, it'll transfer you to a live person. And some, oftentimes the deaf, the deaf caller didn't know that that was the case. And there were times where interpreters would just give out the different options and do nothing about that and, and expect the deaf caller to be able to make the choice, but there were others who felt that they were allies to the deaf community and did something else in order to make the call successful. And in terms of witnessing abuse, there was one interpreter who saw uh, abuse happening on a video call, and this is the example from what she saw. So this type of situation does occur, not just when you're witnessing abuse, but even for 911 calls in general. This person did call 911, and the abuser came into the room and disconnected the call. The interpreter tried to call back several times to reconnect the caller, and it didn't work. Um, the 911 operator was still on the line, so the interpreter decided to explain all the visual information that they had seen when the caller was connected. So even though there was not a deaf caller connected any longer, and they were disconnected from that deaf caller, they still felt the need to relay information to 911. And then uh, the interpreter had to take a break, and after this call was over, they took some time from the phone and, and from um, actively interpreting and told the manager within the call center that they needed to take a walk and take a break because of the fact that this was such an emotional experience. There are some interpreters who feel that they have the power to make these decisions when doing their work, and there are others who don't feel like they have control within the call center, so they will uh, veer toward what they feel they have control over, which would be their work schedule. So oftentimes interpreters would respond by uh, working less hours or working only nights or weekends. And that's typically when you have people who are calling relatives to, or other family members, um, ordering pizza. So the calls that you experience during the work evenings or weekends are very different than the day. And they're typically easier to manage and other interpreters would decide to take time off from working VRS in order to be able to feel like they had control over the work that they were doing. So as I've already mentioned before is that I'm still engaged in this process of doing interviews and there's a lot more data to collect and hopefully I'll have at least 25 more interviews. But the whole goal of doing this research is to share information with students because students typically graduate and go straight into working in the VRS industry or some will go into an educational setting and then work VRS in the evening hours. And th those are the interpreters who really need to be trained about VRS and about what it is that you need to know when working in a VRS setting. And for people who've already been working in VRS, have often felt isolated or alone in making certain decisions and may not necessarily realize that there are other people who are experiencing the same thing. So this is one way and one avenue to be able to educate the entire community about what's happening within VRS and to let people know that they are not alone. And also to inform VRS providers as well as FCC representatives of what the video interpreters' perspectives are. and thinking about 
what is best for the deaf community and making sure that the deaf community is also involved in showing their perspectives and how it relates to the rules and regulations that are here impacting their work. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Annie. Thank you, Erica. I think uh, her research uh, is a nice segue into my own uh, research as well. So thank you very much for your presentation. I spent several years working in the DRS environment. And during my break uh, times, I would often go into the kitchen and interact with other VRS interpreters. And I noticed often that um, through our conversation, there were a lot of questions and discussion about the FCC or the VRS providers and who is establishing um, regulations, but also what our actual lives look like when we're in the interpreting environment in VRS. Uh, what does it look like when we're interacting with our callers? Not necessarily um, taking time to have a social conversation with our callers, but how do we interact with our callers through these relayed conversations? And so in my research, I wanted to look at approaches and study what other interpreters are experiencing um, and connecting that as well with my own experience specifically um, looking at a sociolinguistic approach and what's happening in that type of discourse. So I've taken a look at the topic of footing and I've been researching footing for a couple of years and I've noticed that when I talk to people about my research on footing, the question is, what is footing? Is that how people interpreters stand? Is it about how interpreters dance? Uh, so I have had to take time to explain what it is. And, and what it is is basically a concept in how interpreters align with people. So for this study, I'm looking at when interpreters may add something as an interpreter. Maybe I add a word or a phrase. Maybe it's one sign or one spoken word in English. Maybe the hearing caller is not saying something uh, specific or a deaf caller has not said something specific, but I, as the interpreter, feel as though there needs to be a specific utterance, and so I'll actually insert that, and that's a, p a part of our work in footing. So I looked at other uh, research uh, on interpreters and how um, the interpreter's role is more than a conduit and how we approach the environments uh, when we're working and interacting with both hearing and deaf people as interpreters. Roy Metzger, uh, Roy and Metzger both found that interpreters are actively engaged and Metzger also looked specifically at footing shifts within interpretations. And I used her research to apply it to the VRS environment to see how interpreters are using footing or shifting, how they're informing their callers of the process and what the interpreters are actually doing in VRS settings. So this is my research question. What are features of interpreter footing shifts in VRS? And we've already explained uh, what VRS is. Essentially, you have a deaf caller and a hearing caller and the interpreter uh, as the person in the middle, essentially relaying that conversation. So 
So in 1999, Metzger established eight categories of footing shifts and divided them into two categories, one into relays, which essentially is something that the interpreter has said or inserted into the interpretation. Also, if there's a, a large meeting and there are multiple people in uh, the meeting, the interpreter will take on the role of essentially indicating who is speaking by pointing, and that is called source attributions. Also, interpreters repeat information. We explain or add, expand on pieces of information. And as Erica mentioned, in VRS, often interpreters will ask for clarification. And that is where the interpreter is actually saying something. In the second category, we have interaction management, which is identified by um, different attributes related to how the interpreter interacts with individuals in the room. It could be introductions, uh, introductions of myself as the interpreter. It could be responses to a question asked to me as the interpreter. It could also be interference, noise in the room, or a knocking on the door and informing the deaf participants of someone knocking at the door and also summons, trying to someone, sum, summon someone's attention. So these are the eight categories established by Metzger, and I use these um, in application to research in my data in VRS. So I wanted to research VRS and use the discourse analysis approach, and certainly we're not allowed to record live uh, video relay calls, and so I actually created simulated VRS calls. I set up the equipment and uh, made sure that there was a VRS environment set up for the interpreter, which is essentially the same as a real VRS environment. We had hearing callers using their personal phones and deaf callers using their video phones, typically from their homes in their natural environment. And one of the reasons why I wanted um, the deaf person to call from their homes or from their offices is so that it felt authentic to them. And, uh, and the interpreters came here to use the simulated setting. So we had three interpreters. As participants, and I had a specific criteria, which was a minimum of five years interpreting experience, as well as five years of experience working in VRS. They were all nationally certified recruited three caller dyads. The first was a deaf mother talking with her CODA son. The second was a colleague calling another colleague. And the third was a hearing professor talking with a deaf student. And I had asked for them to have their calls last up to 30 minutes. Certainly we know that for interpreters, uh, once we hit a 20 or 30 minute point, we will call for a team. And so we were um, limited to one interpreter per uh, study. And so we were able to um, receive data from approximately 27 minutes of calls and I think that that gave um, for us um, some very rich data. 
We were very appreciative of that. We used the Elon program to code and transcribe our information from the video work of the interpreters and the deaf individuals, as well as adding the audio recordings of the hearing callers. And we, up I applied these eight categories, as you can see here, um, of the footing shifts. And so each time I saw a footing shift, I coded it. And I coded it in a specific color. And within my results, I found that all eight categories uh, of footing shifts were found to be applied in the VRS environment, um, which I found pretty amazing that I was able to code for each of those categories. And the results give you uh, an idea of how many of these uh, attributes I found in each of the calls. And as I was analyzing the results, I noticed a few themes that didn't fit into the eight categories. And I wasn't sure how to code for these other um, instances. And there were two things that came up often. One was the interpreter would say something in terms of um, turn-taking management. And the second was managing with technology, maybe issues of um, you know, the calls, um, technology, and having to resolve that issue. And so as you can see here, I, s I set up two new categories. And I found that there were a lot of instances within both of these. And so as I move on through this presentation, I'd actually like to show you some actual video footage to show you what I mean by these uh, instances and the footing shifts. Here the first example. Included two types of footing shifts. The first was interference of technical equipment and source attribution. So the interpreter noticed that there was an issue with the sound and informed the deaf caller. And so because the interpreter shifted from role to communicate with the deaf caller uh, and then shifted back to the hearing caller, um, there was another piece where the interpreter said, she said, to inform the hearing caller that it was the deaf person speaking. And then there was also um, a piece where they're referencing the person to inform the hearing caller to inform the deaf person that the hearing caller is now speaking rather than the interpreter speaking. Okay, and I'm gonna show you an example of this now. So you see it was a very brief uh, footing shift, but she was informing the deaf caller that there was an issue with um, the sound and there was interference from the sound. 
but it wasn't the hearing caller saying that there is a sound interference. It was the interpreter speaking to the deaf client and felt that it was important to inform the deaf client of the issue with the sound quality. In this next example, there were, uh, again, many layers of um, examples of footing shifts. I think I identified five footing shifts that happened in the same call. So in this uh, film, the deaf caller decided to use a mobile video phone. And so often there was a uh, disconnect from the video, and so essentially the video would freeze. And the interpreter had to inform both the deaf client that the video was frozen and also inform the hearing caller that the video was frozen. And I'll show you a clip of that now. So you see that the interpreter had to take on more responsibility than normal in just one instance to inform both the deaf person and the hearing person almost simultaneously of the issues with the quality of the video. And then inform them when uh, the video quality was clear and used third person to inform the hearing person that the deaf client was back on the call and went back into the, the interpreter's role to interpret. So as I mentioned, uh, I added two new categories related to footing shifts. The second one is technology management. And that was a common theme that came up in interviews. There may have been issues with recordings or phone trees. Sometimes a recording would ask for an access code. And in this study, we looked at how We also so we also we actually used a conference audio re audio conference software in order to record this, and we analyzed so that we could analyze how um, the the conversations were actually happening. So we had the hearing caller connect through the conference software, and at the beginning of the call, it asked for an access code, and the deaf person had that information ready but often they don't have it um, right there or they forget to have it available. And so when that happens, um, there's direct communication with the interpreter. The interpreter asks the deaf client for the access code or informs them that um, we've run out of time to respond to the phone tree and we have to hang up and call back again. So these are some examples of technology management. So in this first example of technology management, the deaf person forgot uh, the to um, share the access code with the interpreter. And so the interpreter interpreted the um, request for an access code, and the deaf client didn't have it, but the interpreter continued interpreting, but also um, shifted into some sort a, a more direct role with the deaf client 
to get the access code um, applied and then continued interpreting with the call. And the audio recording also um, informed the interpreter and the caller that if they didn't have an access code to hit pound. And so when the deaf client said, ooh, I don't have the access code, the interpreter knew to go ahead and press pound. And asked the deaf caller, should I go ahead and press pound? So clearly there was a lot of interaction between the interpreter and the deaf caller before there was even a connection with the hearing um, conference call. Okay, in this next example, the deaf person informs the interpreter that they have an access code and the interpreter proceeds to interpret the call. But something happens in terms of timing, and she heard the beep, and the interpreter interprets the meaning of the beep. And you'll see the interpreter have a direct interaction with the caller and inform the caller that the call is timed out and they need to hang up and call back again. So I think for technology management, I think it's easy to assume that interpreters are only dealing with um, maybe the actual hardware systems, but there's also a lot of footing shift related to what is happening during the call or within the calls, which are um, shown in these examples here. So as I mentioned earlier, in my conversations with interpreters, I had seen reoccurring themes, and I wanted to then create some sort of uh, research um, publication so that we could make connections, we could provide best practices. I also think that there is a, uh, a gap. Um, you know, when we established uh, the simulated environment and recruited um, deaf participants and interpreting participants and created different types of phone calls, you know, personal phone calls or professional phone calls, phone calls. Um, some, some, it'd be nice to add more variation in types of calls in the future. Um, you know, often 
you're interpreting a personal call one minute, and then 10 minutes later, you're interpreting a very formal business call. And I'd like to have that reflected in the research uh, more than we did in this study. And I hope that uh, this also supports uh, Metzger's and Roy's research to show that interpreters are a member of the uh, interpreting environment. Okay, and in conclusion, we have applied uh, Metzger's findings to a new type of data, which is in the VRS environment, and I think that this could have some very interesting implications for um, training future VRS interpreters. And I also would like to think about um, how we use this in pedagogy and training and policy when we talk about footing in discourse, but also recognizing all of the different perspectives of the people who are involved in this interpreted environment deaf people's perspectives, hearing people's perspectives, and the interpreter perspective. When interpreters have direct discourse with both deaf and hearing callers, how does that affect what's happening in the interpreted environment for them as users? And so I think having more interaction with the deaf community and hearing uh, users of VRS as well as VRS interpreters and VRS providers, if we could work together further to create uh, a more successful provision of video relay service. I think also it would be very nice if we could add uh, a corpus, a VRS corpus of information. I think that that would be difficult because we do have regulations to follow in terms of not being able to film actual calls. So we'd have to figure out uh, you know, best practices in terms of gathering that data, but I do think it is possible. And we would like to take a moment to thank um, these organizations and groups for, for, su for supporting our research, um, both in funding and in other ways as well. And we're very excited to welcome Dr. Valerie Dively, who will be asking us several different questions related to our presentation. Good afternoon. I have two questions, uh, two questions for both of you. And Erica, I'll ask uh, my first question to you. What uh, future research or action would you recommend for making needed changes in the current FCC policy on VRS interpreting? Are they action items, um, or are there anything that you're doing right now? I think that's a great question. And it's interesting looking at the charge of the FCC, and there, there needs to be a balance. There needs to obviously be a structure within VRS, and at the same time, there needs to be flexibility for interpreters to be able to do their job effectively. So. Trying to find that balance is going to be an interesting endeavor. Um, I'm not saying that anything needs to be said at this point in time, uh, but there need to be more perspectives that are involved before anything does happen. The FCC's perspective needs to be at play. The VRS providers have their own perspectives to offer, as well as the interpreters and the deaf community. And I think that that's the only way that any positive will come out of all of this for the VRS uh, services in the future for us to be able to work together and provide what's best to the deaf community. Looking at future research, um, I think, you know, this really opens the world to us. This is just the first of its kind, and, and I'm sure that there will be more research coming from uh, real situations that we'd be able to do, and hopefully we'll be able to get to a point where we can do that. Um, if we cannot analyze real situations or live situations, then we'll have to base our conclusions on what we assume the expectations are, and hopefully in the future we will be able to then conduct research using actual data from actual calls. Well, that's very interesting because as a deaf member, um, I you know would also like to share this information with my own community. 
And I have a second question for you. What would you recommend um, US deaf communities do for making needed changes on current FCC policy on VRS interpreting? And that's also a great question. I think that the deaf community has a critical role to play within VRS reform. The FCC has been making decisions and putting them in play, as well as providers, and deaf community members haven't really been at the forefront of that. If th we have the involvement from the deaf community, that can be an important part of the change. And with their feedback, the FCC will be able to see what it is that the deaf community really needs, as opposed to their own perspective or even interpreters' perspectives of what we assume the deaf community needs and what works best for them. We often assume what works best for us, but we can't necessarily assume what's working best for the community. These are people who are a part of this whole entire interaction, and access is really Im imperative for them to be able to receive accessible services. And I think that this is, would be a collaborative experience that would work as opposed to interpreters doing the work for the deaf community and assuming that we know what's best, because oftentimes we do not. Well, thank you very much. And now I'll ask Fanny a few questions. You had uh, talked about, at the end of your presentation, specific types of research that you would like to continue. What types of research do you think needs to be conducted in terms of uh, how VRS technologies impact uh, the VRS interpreted environment and you know, how you interact with both deaf and hearing callers? Well, technology is growing at a, a rapid rate. I think we see a lot of changes happening every day. Uh, there are new phones being created, new um, tablets, iPads, laptops, and all of that is, um, you know, has implications to VRS technology. As you saw in one example, one person was using a mobile phone to make a, a VRS call, and there were interferences um, in, in that call. I think that we could do more research in terms of um, using mobile technology in VRS how the, and how the interpreters interact with the callers, and more importantly, how we train interpreters to be prepared for those types of um, interferences or problems that will arise, but then how can we still create effective interpreted interactions. So based on your research um, with technology management, what specific training would you recommend that interpreters who are working in VRS have? And even in interpreting training programs, what do you think would be important for training for VRS interpreters? Well, I would recommend that we train interpreters um, to be able to identify footing shifts in both community interpreting assignments and then also in video relay service um, provision and how they're different. I also think it's important that we teach interpreting students to recognize that interaction is an important part of learning, interacting with deaf callers, um, hearing callers, and understanding their perspectives in terms of um, VRS interpreting. Okay, and we'll now open the floor to questions. If anyone in the audience has questions, please feel free to do so at this time. Hello again, and really enjoyed the discussion that we had here thus far and the research that you're doing. I know that interpreters often feel that they're not necessarily sure about what to do in any given situation, and that's been true for several years. So thank you for being here, um, presenting about your research. Thank you for doing the research. And first, I just wanted to mention that I know there was research that had happened in the past that really supports Annie's findings about technology impacts and how that plays a part on the interpreted interactions. And so that's what I was thinking about when you were presenting. And I think one comes from 1973 or 74, 
where there were several studies that were done by hearing discourse analysts looking at spoken English conversations and seeing the discourse structure, but then also considering um, when they didn't explicitly call it technology, but how that plays a part on phone call interactions, where you don't have the face-to-face -face interaction, where you don't have body language, and then, you know, even thinking about it being a wired connection where you weren't able to walk around and have a conversation at that point in time. So that was research that was done in the past, and I feel like it has application to your findings that you've seen from your own research. And the other one is 2003, done by Keating and Myris, where they were looking at uh, uh, ASL interactions with deaf participants and seeing the uh, impact of discourse used through video technology and you know whether or not people were looking from behind the, the person who was on the video call and several other factors about how that played a part on the discourse interaction. And so I think that also has the uh, application to your own research here. So my question I think is geared to both of you and I obviously know that there is work that's been done about discourse and looking at discourse analysis and looking at how they have to oft often ask for clarification and do a whole host of things. But thinking about your own research too is you're looking at policy and how the two of them can come together to lead to positive change in the future. So how can that all be done, do you think? I'm happy that you raised uh, the study done by Keating and Myris. I know that they did find several different um, factors related to technology in a deaf person's perspective. Even when thinking about it being done on a video screen, your space is limited to your signing space in front of you. So how we use our signing space to fit with technology. And I think Myris also noticed something about how we fingerspell less when we're using technology. So I'm ha happy that you raised that research study. And how these studies can come together, I think that with Annie and the research that she has done, that shows what it is that we do in a VRS setting. And I think it's important to show the FCC that and those who are making and developing curriculum regarding it about what it is that we actually do. It may not have an influence or an impact on policy change, but it would be nice to be able to influence and educate students who are within the field about what it is that we actually do. So I think it's nice that we had this opportunity to present together. And Annie, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Absolutely. I know that you and I both have shared interests, and one of them is to develop a curriculum for VRS interpreting. Right now, it seems that there is no established curriculum for training. There are companies and providers that provide their own trainings, and I think that they touch on it in interpreting training programs, but there's no uh, full curriculum focused on VRS interpreting. I think most interpreters attend um, workshops, and that's where they're learning their practices. And I think that there's going to be a need for more um, established curriculum in the future. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentations. They were fantastic. Um, when you talked about um, your findings in terms of making a complaint against a caller, uh, I know that frequently interpreters will hang up on callers and that there's a less of a tolerance for managing difficult phone calls. And I'm wondering if we could look at when a person is actually being um, abusive to an interpreter compared to the interpreter maybe not being um, necessarily qualified or, or satisfactory in the work. You know, how can we balance those two perspectives? managing both the interpreter's tolerance with deaf callers. So if from, for myself, as, as an example, 
if I uh, make a mistake in a call and the deaf caller becomes frustrated, I certainly uh, take the onus on myself and try to manage the call. Um, but if a caller comes in, you know, rude at the front, then I may not be able to tolerate that. So how would you actually be able to differ differentiate between the two and how can we find that balance? That is an important point. I know that sometimes interpreters uh, become frustrated because the caller is mean or is rude. And we each have our own lives and level of tolerance. And one of the participants in my study that I recently interviewed had said that they might be the one call that that person's making that entire day. But for me as the interpreter, I've been through several of these calls already. And so my level of tolerance is reduced. So thinking about how the interpreter's frustration has an influence on that person's call or that interaction. And it, it may be that that deaf person has called this person time and time again, and their level of frustration is heightened because of the fact that they've had to repeatedly call. And then how that has an influence on the interaction. Then maybe we're pointing fingers at each other, blaming each other, whereas we need to think about how we can better communicate in order to resolve the issue. I think oftentimes as interpreters, we look at it only from our perspective. And there are deaf people who are out there who've been frustrated by uh, interpreters that aren't necessarily competent in order to interpret their phone calls. So I think, again, we need to work on this together in order to resolve the issue. Next question. Thank you very much. Um, I was especially excited to see your presentation because as a PhD student, it was really nice to look at your work and uh, see where you are in the process um, before you've even become published. And it's just fantastic that you're able to share what you have today. So I have a question for Annie. Uh, in terms of that conversation between the caller and the interpreter, um, in terms of clarifications or um, informing or the caller about having to push the pound key. When you're working with the hearing caller, I've noticed, um, I noticed that when there was the interruption with the video caller, you informed the hearing caller of that. And I'm just wondering if there are any parallels in how the interpreters create rapport with the hearing caller like they do with deaf callers. You know, sometimes when uh, a, a deaf caller is on a, a call and there's, they're on hold, the interpreter will sometimes have a conversation with the deaf caller and that creates rapport. And I just wonder if any of that happens with the hearing callers as well. I did find that there were some footing shifts when it came to the interpreter communicating with hearing callers. In my example, I showed uh, the footing shifts with the deaf caller because it was easiest in the video. But I did see that there were a lot of, a lot more footing shifts and direct communication with deaf callers than there were with hearing callers. And so your question in terms of how we create more rapport with the hearing caller, I think is a very good question. When I worked in VRS, I often felt more of a rapport with the deaf caller. And I think that's because there's the visual aspect. And as well, when we're on hold and you know, we're both sitting there and we don't necessarily get into heavy content, you know, conversations, but sometimes a question is asked by the deaf person and we start a conversation. I think that uh as interpreters, there's more cultural awareness and how to create rapport with deaf callers. And uh, honestly, uh, sometimes I think it can be more frustrating when interacting with hearing callers, especially when you're calling for support or tech support and you hear a hearing caller from uh, another country with a very strong accent. It can be difficult to understand them. And I've often noticed that for myself, in that environment, I create more of a rapport with the hearing caller. I might say, my, you know, as the interpreter, I can't understand you. Would you mind repeating uh, what you just said? 
And that is the type of rapport building that I find more with hearing callers. But in general, in my own experience, um, I do notice that there's more rapport building with deaf callers. You know, and I think that's only not true in VRS environments, but also in um, community interpreting as well. Interpreters typically develop more of a rapport with um, the deaf people in the room than the hearing. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Melanie Musker, who'd like to come up and say a few words. Okay, so I have a, a few more things that I would like to uh, say before we close. I'd like to also welcome students from Sinclair College from Ohio. I met them today, and I'm happy that you all could be here. And so welcome to Gallaudet. I'd also like to welcome our dean, Dr. Isaac Agbula, dean of the School of Education, Business, and Humanities. I'm sorry, Human Services. So we're very happy that you're here with us today. Uh, also pleased to have the director of the Gallaudet Interpreting uh, Services here, GIS, Coco Chino, welcome. And also I'd like to thank uh, our interpreters who are working today. Thank you very much. We'd also like to thank the Gallaudet TV department for their work in supporting this excellent uh, live stream for those who could not be here today to actually be able to participate. And I'm so sorry, I also forgot to thank uh, everyone um, for being here. And I'm sorry that uh, I missed some people today. And especially I'd like to thank the presenters. And we do have a small uh, gift for you. Thank you very much for being here today. We hope to see you for the March 28th uh, International Symposium. It'll be a very exciting event. And we also hope to see you April 15th for our next lecture. And I'd also like to let you know that our three programs, our bachelor's, master's, and PhD programs, are open to both new and experienced interpreters. Uh, if you're interested in applying to these programs, we are now accepting applications for all three programs, and we would love to have you join our growing family. Thank you very much for your time today.